Test, test. Ah, this seems to be working. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much to coming to this roundtable on how to really do AI governance beyond voluntary ethics frameworks. Um, I want to extend a special welcome to the three panelists for the roundtable, Vidushi Marda of Article 19, Bernard Chen of Microsoft, and Vicky Janssen uh, of the um, Data Justice Lab. So my name is Corinne, I'm a PhD student at the Oxford Internet Institute, and I'll be moderating this panel for you today. Um, and this session is going to be structured as follows. We're going to start off with a bit of a short primer, um, contextualizing the, content, the contention around AI ethics, um, having a bit of a look at the debate uh, on how to govern and regulate AI systems. And after that, each speaker will take about 10 minutes to give their views. This is followed by a short panel discussion uh, between the panelists, and then we'll open up for Q&A. Um, so to get a bit of a sense of the current discussion, um, a recent quote, the relevant discussions of ethics are based on almost entirely open-ended notions that are not necessarily grounded in legal or even philosophical arguments and can be shaped to suit the needs of industry. These are choice words coming from the most recent report of the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, who questions the efficacy of ethics as a framework for AI governance, arguing that it provides little accountability while cementing the needs of industry players. He's obviously not alone in voicing these kind of criticisms um, about what is often dubbed as the turn to ethics in the debate about what normative and legal frameworks are best for AI governance. Um, AI ethics, as it seems, is, going, is undergoing its own tech lash moment right now. And some of the critiques leveraged is whether these fr uh, frameworks and councils can ever lead to real accountability or are a sufficient preamble to regulation. They also argue that ethical frameworks and councils can be fuzzy, uh, lack shared understanding, are easy to co-opt, and don't really foster uh, actionable corporate accountability. At the same time, there are many others who argue we should not throw out the baby with the bathwater, uh, and that when done right, these kind of frameworks actually do provide a very solid base for which to think about the problems that AI raises in our societies. Now, it's clear that, if anything, this is a very contentious discussion, and that's why we're all here today. Um, and the discussion is particularly timely given the increased use of automated systems in very society-critical um, spheres, like healthcare, like policing, like the judiciary. Now, what we're going to do in this roundtable is try and focus on three things. So the first is we'll discuss the recent surge in ethical frameworks and self-regulatory um, councils for AI governance. The second is we'll talk about some of their promises and pitfalls. And then finally, we're also going to discuss some other strategies and frameworks, including those based on human rights law, as a viable alternative for or addition to discussions about ethics. Um, what I'll do is I'll ask each speaker to introduce themselves. And with that, I would like to give Bernard the floor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to have a conversation with all of you here at IGF. My name is Bernard Shen. I'm an assistant general counsel at the Corporate External Legal Affairs Department of Microsoft. I'm on the human rights team uh, working on human rights, human rights issues that intersect our products, services, and technology around the world. Turning to the subject at hand, when we consider how we should govern AI, one question that occurs to me is, do we have to choose between ethical frameworks on the one hand and human rights law on the other? Are ethics inherently voluntary? Is it optional? For example, unfair discrimination is unethical, but it is also often against the law. Are human rights only respected and protected by laws? Again, for example, anti-discrimination laws prohibit unfair discrimination. But are those laws alone enough to help advance and protect the rights of a vulnerable population? Perhaps one way to think about this is that ethics are referring to our conduct, what we do, and how we do it. Human rights refer to the consequences of that conduct, the consequences to the people and their rights. They are connected 
as connected as two sides of the same coin. I ask, can conduct that harms human rights be ethical conduct? Or does ethical conduct inherently mean conduct that respect and protect human rights? Let's consider a simple example, someone driving down the street at the maximum speed limit allowed. So the driver is obeying the law. But then the driver sees somebody, children, playing up ahead on the street. She immediately slows down. Now, is that a matter of the law, or is that also an act of ethical, responsible self-governance? AI is a tool, and as a tool, whether it does harm or good, depends less on the tool itself and more on the human hand that wields it. And as a tool, AI can and is used in almost anything and everything that we do. Why is that? That's because today's AI, modern AI, almost always involves machine learning. Using math to look at an incredible amount of data, too much data for the human mind to comprehend, to study, to see, and to deduce kind of the hidden patterns and insights in the large quantity of data. But computer science and math can help us see those patterns. And with varying degrees of mathematical uh, confidence, generate some predictions, mathematical predictions. And we take those learnings and predictions that the machine and the math provide us to help us humans do tasks that we as humans define or make decisions on questions that we as humans pose. For example, in farming, how do we be more efficient, less wasteful? In medicine, how do we find cures more quickly or make more accurate diagnoses? For the environment, how do we better pre preserve the natural resources that we have? So it really can be used in any fields there where there's an increasing amount of data and help us gain insights and make better decisions. But the challenge is, because there are so many possible uses, each type of use presents a different context. And the ways to use AI in each context in a way that's ethical, responsible, and rights-respecting may be very different. And because it is so contextual, we really need to think about these issues with a context in mind. And I'm going to use one context to kind of walk through it a little bit. And that's the use of facial recognition by government authorities. Let's imagine five scenarios. Scenario number one, you're participating in a protest march. The government is using cameras and facial recognition not only to identify you during the march, but also to identify you and track you wherever you go afterwards. How do you feel about that? Scenario two, if you have a driver's license, you've gone down to the driver's license office, have your photo taken, they have it on file, and now, let's say there are crimes uh, being committed by someone, video cameras capture an image of the suspect, but they don't know who that is. Should, they, should law enforcement be able to use facial recognition technology compared to unknown image against all the driver's license photos to find a match, including your photo? Scenario three, a government has lots of sensitive government buildings, sensitive data, should it require all the employees who use smartphones, computers, to protect those devices with uh, facial recognition, not just password, because password can be oversimple, can be guessed. So you have to use face, you know, uh, facial recognition to lock your devices. Or when you enter a building as government employees, should they say, we have all your photos on file, you can't enter the front door until you show up and have your take picture taken matched to the photo on file. If it's really you, then you can't enter. If not, then you probably have to be further checked out. Passport control. In the good old days, when you enter a country, you talk to a person, you hand over your passport, they look at you, they look at your passport photo to see if it's really you before you can enter. Now, more and more in many countries, you don't get to talk to a person. You stand in front of a terminal, you scan your passport, they scan your photo, there's a match, and you probably never even talk to a real person during that entire process. Scenario four, this is a bit heavy, but let's say you have a friend, a family member went missing, and there's reasonable suspicion that there's kidnapping, maybe tr human trafficking involved. 
you gave the photos of your loved ones or your friend to the police, they have it. They're trying to help find this person, save this person. Should they, be able, should they be able to use video cameras in all public places, airports, train stations, and capture images of people going in and out and compare it to the photo of your friend or family member to help find your friend or family member and save him or her? Last scenario, scenario five. You're a music lover, you are going to a concert, a big, huge stadium. But police authorities have reliable intelligence that a terrorist group is trying to target this event with a bombing. They have photos of the members of this terrorist cell. Should they be able to use cameras at the entries, and entryways of all, at, all this, at the stadium and look at everybody that come in and compare, to the compare everyone to the photos of the, of the members of the terrorist cell to try to stop them from entering the stadium. So just a quick note, you know, if you think about these scenarios from a technical standpoint, from a technology standpoint, there are really two things going on here, two different types of facial recognition. One is verification, one is identification. Verification means it's, it's a one-to-one -one comparison. You know, we already have the photo of a known person, someone presents himself or herself at that person and you want to make sure it's really him, really her, before they can unlock their computer device, before they can enter a building, before they can enter a country. The second technological use is identification. You have a captured image, but you don't know who that is, and you're trying to identify that person. And somewhere you have a database of photos with known persons, and you're trying to cap compare that unknown image to all the known images to see if you can find a match so that you can identify that person. But you know, regardless of the math, uh, technological difference of what the comparison is, the question comes back to in each of these and many other scenarios, how should governments use this technology? Should, should we rely on self-governance by tech companies that provide this technology to governments to help prevent governments from misusing this technology? Certainly, tech companies have a role because you know, we understand the technology, we know how it works. We can help the government understand what it can or cannot do. When is it reliable? When is it not? And help steer them away from inappropriate use. In fact, you know, Microsoft has publicly gone on the record that we have turned down some, uh, re without identifying the police authority, but acknowledged that we have turned down opportunities because we felt that the uh, proposed use was not appropriate uh, given the state of technology and the circumstance involved. So yes, tech, tech companies certainly have a role, but the problem is even if some companies try to act, responsibility, act, try to act responsibly, there will be, if you have some other companies that do not, then you still have a problem because they would still be ready and willing to provide the technology to governments and, and use the technology in ways that the public, we the public, find unacceptable. So we also need the government to regulate itself with thoughtful regulations on all of these use cases. But we also, as I mentioned, the tech companies also have a role. We, we also need to uh, Act, engage in self-governance, to have policies and guidelines. And the two kind of work hand in hand because laws enact quickly and they often get outdated quickly because the technology develops very quickly. And if we develop a, a law that covers today, today's technology and today's scenarios, the technology so, moves so fast and the law would, would, would fall behind. And so it's also important that both governments and the tech companies that develop and provide the technology have policy and guidelines to think about new scenarios, evolving scenarios, how to address it, and longer term, more new laws may be needed. So let me close with something that Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella wrote in an article in June of 2016, uh, where he talked about the partnership between humans and AI. He said the most productive debate isn't whether AI is good or evil, but that, and I quote, it's about the values instilled in the people and in institutions creating this technology, unquote. So when societies enact laws, or when we have international laws, those laws often reflect the values of us human beings. 
But values are more than laws. They also inspire and guide us to self-govern, to engage in responsible ethical conduct, conduct that respects and protects human rights. So what we need is all of us in this room and beyond, all of society, to be involved in these conversations. Conversations to figure out thoughtful laws to regulate the use of AI, self-governance policies and guidelines for responsible conduct by governments, by tech companies that develop the technology, and by all the institutions, whether it be government, private, nonprofits, or any other institutions that implement and use the technology in so many different contexts. We need everyone at the table to have these conversations because ultimately these are conversations about our values, how we connect the ways we use the technology tools that we have to our values. I look forward to having these conversations with you today. Thank you. Thanks, Corinne. Um, for my initial uh, intervention, I'd, I'd, I'd like to throw... Oh, sorry, I have to introduce myself first. Hi, I'm Vidushi. I work at Article 19 um, on machine learning, where we focus on both tech spaces like the IEEE, uh, but also in policy discussions um, and sort of try and bridge the gap between language and um, assumptions that underpin both of these um, stakeholder groups. So for my initial intervention, I'd like to throw out four provocations to the group, just to add texture to what Bernard just said, but also for us to um, have a more critical understanding of the space in general. Uh, so the first is, machine learning is not always appropriate for social um, for social purposes. So for instance, there's a lot of talk about how data is really effective and how machine learning can look at a large amount of data that no human can. But I think a big part of this puzzle is that maybe we shouldn't be using machine learning for many, many instances where um, the, the system oversimplifies socio-technical problems and tries to reduce them to mathematical uh, formula. So that is the, I, I think, ethical frameworks at the moment don't fully engage with this complication, which is what we're finding, where you can say we want transparency and equality and we respect privacy, but at the same time, you can be undermining a lot of social um, problems, but also making discrimination worse and social problems worse. So that's the first provocation, that it's not always appropriate, and that is a piece of a puzzle that ethical frameworks at the moment don't fully engage with. The second is I think there's a false dichotomy between ethical frameworks and regulation, because one is not necessarily the replacement for another, uh, and neither is it, I think, constructive to think about ethics as a preamble to regulation. What ethics affords us is an idea of this is where we want to be, this is what our conduct should look like, but it has no bearing whatsoever on this is what happens when we don't behave the way we should. So in a sense, it's, it's kind of a jigsaw puzzle where we say this is where we want to go and this is what we can do. The part that says this is what we can do is regulation. And it doesn't make sense to have ethical frameworks in the absence of regulation because there's no incentive to um, effectively follow these ethical frameworks. Um, ethical frameworks don't have teeth which means that there is no consequence to not following them. And again, if we really want to be effective with ethical frameworks, then having regulation is a prerequisite to it. It's not necessarily an either or situation, it's not a before or after, it must exist um, in tandem if it has to exist at all. The third uh, provocation I'd like to throw out is that ethics affords a sort of exceptionalism to machine learning that I don't think is fully merited. And what I mean by that is, Ethical frameworks assume that machine learning should and shouldn't do something, or artificial intelligence more broadly should or shouldn't do something, but we're not going back to first principles of law. So a lot of the questions we have around facial recognition and credit scoring are found in constitutional law, they're found in consumer protection, they're found in data protection, but because there's this new, quote unquote, really complicated technology, we suddenly go back to the drawing table without really engaging with existing regulation that's already in place. And the problem with ethical frameworks currently is also that they're built 
mostly in opaque closed rooms by people who design and develop these systems, but not necessarily people who are subject to their deployment. So what happens is you're subject to a system and you're not fully sure how you can appeal it because there's no mechanism for it. And the only verifiable public statement that you have are ethical frameworks which you can't appeal and you can't fully understand because there's no one meaning of transparency, there's no one meaning of privacy, there's no one meaning of accountability. And the last is, I think, only having ethical frameworks is more harmful than not having them at all because they also offer a shield of objectivity when there is none. So, so a company, and it can be any company, um, can say, you know, we have an ethical framework where we believe in transparency and accountability and privacy and we respect, um, you know, non-discrimination, for instance. And it, it almost gives the company the right to, uh, you know, move fast and break things and see how systems function without engaging with the actual social cost of these systems uh, because there's an ethical commitment in place. In the absence of this ethical commitment, we would have regulation and actual verifiable accountability mechanisms that any system should, should um, satisfy. And I think ethical frameworks buy time, which I think is extremely harmful. Um, I'd like to end also by saying, I think it's important to remember that human rights are an ethical and a legal framework. So I think the false dichotomy is also particularly dangerous because it discounts the ethical normative importance of human rights frameworks or rights-based frameworks in general. And it would be more helpful to think about it in terms of, well, ethical frameworks are enough, but do they invoke the right kinds of regulation, existing rights and first principles that we already have? I'll stop there and then I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fudushi. Um, hi, I'm Fike Janssen, and I'm a part of the Data Justice Lab at Cardiff University. Um, and I would ask anybody to reframe if you're tweeting to use the um, Data Justice hashtag, because they're currently on strike due to austerity measures in the UK against uh, the higher education system. So uh, they don't want to cross the digital picket line. And I think with austerity, so I'll be, um, I do research into how police in Western Europe is using data and technology and sort of what the new social questions are. Uh, and before this, I spent maybe 10 years working as a practitioner on issues around data privacy, digital security, data protection. And I sort of, um, I think we'll piggyback on a lot of things that Fudushi said and maybe ground them a little bit in the context of Europe and also in the context of public institutions in Europe. Um, because I think there's so many like things we should uncover. Um, having spent a lot of time in the tech scene talking to technologists, I think it's very important that we start unpacking all the discourse around AI and especially around ethics and AI. Because there is this presumption that AI is already here and sort of people just use it blanketly for everything from basic statistical modeling to machine learning. And I think this is creating massive problems because on the one hand, it's not here yet and it's not like implemented blanketly in public institutions in Europe, uh, but it also creates this idea that we can't do anything about it, that it's sort of already happening and we just have to roll over and die. And maybe we can like mitigate the harmful issues by creating ethical frameworks. But I feel like this is a false sort of narrative that's being created. The other thing I also see is that the way people talk about public institutions is if there's, they're stupid, there's no knowledge inside of them, and um, sort of uh, they have no way of regulating this. And I feel like this is just all overstepping the fact that we have a lot of laws in place that also apply to AI. And this idea that law is slower than AI, I feel it's a fallacy that's coming from the people who are creating these systems to prevent us from actually applying the laws that we have into a context. Um, so I'm trying to unpack these things with a few examples. Um, and it's, it is, I think one of the issues is that we look at AI and then look to society, whereas we also can look at society and then try to figure out solutions which probably are not AI. Um, so <clears throat> um, I'll go through some examples that I'm seeing like on the ground in practice. So I think one really interesting case has been sort of DeepMind in the UK and that they had access to uh, healthcare information of um, people, of like patients of the NHS. I think they had like access to 50 million uh, or like a few million records. Um, and according to the 
actual regulation that was governing uh, access from companies to this data, uh, the NHS made the right decision because this data is given for uh, innovation R&D projects all the time. Whether it's to Philips to develop a robot arm to like assist in sort of uh, operation rooms or whether it's for like uh, trying to figure out a treatment. But maybe there's nothing wrong with the regulation where you say should companies get access to um, pseudonymized data of patients so they, they can sort of develop new tools and technologies to help us solve a problem. And I think uh, they were in their rights, but the problem is that in this they didn't look that Google, so the, or Alphabet, the owner of DeepMind, is a data company and their business model is to actually um, analyze data and sell this for a commercial purpose. So I think like we have to open up these frames more to take into account the context and the business models of the people, of the companies who are uh, getting access to this data to train sort of their algorithms and figure out solutions. Uh, and as we saw, there was immense, immense, massive backlash. So once it became public, once the Guardian started reporting on the fact that the NHF gave data to Alphabet, um, it was a massive backlash. And in the end, uh, Alphabet pulled out. So DeepMind pulled out because of all the controversy. And I feel like this should be a societal debate. Do we want companies, big tech companies, to have access to our very private information? But it wasn't a public debate. Um, so this is a point that there is regulation. We just have to revisit it. Um, then with my, with my um, case studies on policing, where I actually talk to police, so also about facial recognition, I think the interesting thing is what they do themselves as well, is some are inverting the process. So when you look at risk taxation or all the examples that were just given about should facial recognition be applied in these contexts, they're sort of relatively easy ethical questions because Nobody's standing up on behalf of the people who get targeted. But what one of the police officers, when I was talking to her about risk aversion, uh, risk taxation, said, what if we apply this device? So what if we apply this to identify uh, perpetrators and victims of um, sexual misconduct? How would we feel the police intervening preemptively in people's lives? Because what are actually the actions we can take on it? Can we preemptively take off offenders off the street? Can we preemptively go into a victim's house and say, there's a highly likelihood you would be sexually um, harassed, raped, or something else in, a, in the near future? And inverting it to another problem than the standard problems all of a sudden makes these uh, questions far more pronounced. And they also said, we don't know if we actually should be the actors doing this. We don't know if police should be doing this. Whether if we talk about the same problem with high impact crime, so it's burglary, robbery, um, identifying terrorists, everybody will... There is a, a sense where people say, yes, we can do it, but inverting it to a different problem all of a sudden shows the issues that also apply in the case of terrorism and high-impact crime. So I think uh, in these debates, I think we sometimes have to challenge it by inverting it. Uh, I think we also have to unpack where this entire ethical debate is coming from. If I look, for instance, at uh, ethics uh, discussions in Europe, a lot of it is also funded and supported by the companies who are creating AI. And I'm not saying that the things that are coming out of it are influenced, so I don't say the content is influenced by these companies, but it is putting, they, they, by putting money behind it, we're, create, we're setting the agenda that we have to look at ethics instead of regulation. And I think we have to sort of uh, be critical about this. Is it bad that they're spending money on this? Maybe not, but then why are not governments spending money and figuring out if the regulatory framework should be different? Because there has to be sort of a balance in this. Um, so I think when we look at all of these uh, talks about ethics and like how do we govern AI, we have to unpack it. What are the interests behind it? Because uh, what I see in policing as well is that there's a lot of money usually made available after an incident happened in society and then we ask the police and they're like, oh, so what do you think about this money being made available, for instance, to implement facial recognition or something else? And they say, oh, we just have to do something to show the public that we care, but we actually don't know if it's going to work. And I think so, so that we have to unpack what are the drivers that are driving the implementation of this on social problems of technology? Um, who are the creators? Because yes, what are the values of the people who are creating AI? But if you look at all the tech companies, uh, there's it's quite a homogeneous crowd who are creating this. Uh, and so it, are their values actually the values that are shared across the world and the values that we all hold into account? So we also have to be critical about this. Um, 
we normally don't take context into account. Things that come from one place, we just assume that will be applied everywhere else, whereas maybe the ethical guidelines of the EU wouldn't apply in other contexts, or they would. But it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, and I think, um, I think we also start, should start having discussions about what are the red lines? What are the places we actually don't want AI to be implemented in? So is it like uh, we, don't want them, we don't want it implemented in identifying fraud detection in welfare schemes? Or do we, there's certain areas where I think we don't want technology be, be implemented if we can't be sure of what the drivers are to do it. Because if it's another austerity measure, this is a problem because in the end, what we're seeing with a lot of these AI systems that they're sort of penalizing the poor, marginalized, and uh, other groups. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Right. Uh, thank you all three for this excellent provocation. So there seems to be um, quite a number of topics that keep on uh, coming up. So the, the limits, but also the, po the possibilities that these frameworks provide. And the question of context. So I think one of the, one of the first com, uh, questions that comes to mind is there are currently uh, many of these ethical frameworks, 70 on my last count. Um, some of their principles contradict, some of their principles overlap. Um, and considering sort of this mushrooming of, of ethical frameworks and the importance that all three of you stressed for context is how do you make sense of these principles from your respective sectors and their contradictions. I think current ethical frameworks, I mean, we've touched on this a little bit already where there are certain deficiencies, but I want to pick up on something Fika just said, which is, we talk about machine learning systems being discriminatory and being built by only certain sections of society and being um, particularly dangerous for vulnerable communities, whether it relates to your gender, your race, where you live. I think the ethical AI field um, kind of makes those systems a microcosm of what the field actually is. So on one hand, we're in a room saying these systems are discriminatory and they only work if you're a white man and they never work if you have darker skin or if you're a woman. But the same is true for ethical frameworks. They work in the areas in which they're built and they're harmful in, in contexts that haven't been considered in the room. Um, and I think no matter how many ethical frameworks we've seen, I have yet to see one that meaningfully engages with the difference in context and the harm that it can create. To give you an example, um, a lot of credit scoring algorithms around the world look at you know, things like how many times do you leave your house? Do you go to the same place every day? Does that mean you have a steady job or not? That wouldn't work in a country like India because a lot of people, you know, a lot of women in many parts of India are not allowed to work. They don't get to leave home. Um, and that fundamental proxy is inconsistent with the context in which it functions. But that is not engaged with at the, at the level of ethical frameworks, right? So a system could be systematically discriminatory against a vulnerable section of a particular society, but ethical frameworks do not engage with the complexity that comes with it. So while there may be 70 at this moment, I'm, I'm, I, I don't feel the need to make sense of all of them. <laughs> to be honest, because I think they say the same thing in different ways and in different permutations and combinations, but they don't actually meaningfully change how these systems are designed or developed or even deployed. So I think the 70 ethical frameworks, I think my, so what I'm seeing from uh, when, when you talk to people who have to implement parts of them or like think through them is that uh, what it obscures is one thing is like the question of should we actually implement something to begin with mm -hmm. so with the question of facial recognition if you see how police are experimenting with it in uh, the UK um, actually for me all of these uh, things that were suggested like uh, can you identify if the right people's walking in the building can you see if a terrorist is walking into a football stadium can you do other things most of these things can actually be done by other police work uh, or other sort of type of work like having somebody in the front door to sort of uh, that recognizes people so for me it's like uh, this drive for innovation first we have to see what it's actually substituting and because we're having ethical discussions uh, this is how do we how do we maneuver it 
in the best way we will see fit without actually asking the question why to begin with. Um, and then the other thing is sort of with, uh, we've also seen this with human rights impact assessment, privacy impact assessments. When it actually comes to the ground where people are implementing, they usually, what they do is they, or well, I've seen some of these privacy impact assessments and you can see that people just basically Googled it because nobody gets training in these police departments on, on actually how to do a proper impact assessment. And the question of whether or not we should implement technology is never the question. So then it's like, how should we implement it? How do we get it through the bureaucracy? How do we make it compliant? Um, so one thing is having these ethical frameworks, but then the other thing is also how do we, how do we, sort of implement these at a lower level scale of uh, government um, and public institutions. And then for me, what is uh, quite like, difficult about these ethical frameworks and what I've seen for a long time in the tech scene is that there's no responsibility. It is quite an impunity for things when things go wrong. So uh, we've seen it so many times also when uh, Google launched their facial recognition algorithm and it identified African-American people as gorillas and they said, oops, sorry. And this is sort of the consequence when things go wrong, whereas for the people it can be super stigmatizing and very horrible, and especially when you apply it then in the context of police, where does the responsibility lie for when things go wrong? Uh, and I think these are the discussions that are sort of not being had because they said like, oh, we went through all the right processes and procedures. Um, so, so yeah, it's also a question about responsibility. Let me make two overall points. First one is, you know, do we need these ethical frameworks? I think we do, because as I think reflected in my opening comments, I don't think law alone is enough. Uh, you're right, there are a lot of ethical fr frameworks, a lot of AI principles, and, and one could be spending an infinite of time to sort through all of that. And I, I guess I would think that that's probably not the best use of time, although you, need, you do need some sort of ethical, ethical reference, because law alone, why is law alone not enough? Uh, a couple of ex examples. I, I don't know if how many of you have heard of this law, but about motor vehicles. In the UK, back in, I think, 1865, I could be wrong, there's this Locomo Locomotive Act you know, motor vehicles were very new and evolving then, and there was a law that says when a motor vehicle moves down the street, you have to have a person walk in front of it waving a red flag to warn everybody else, horse carriages, people walking around that the motor vehicle is approaching. It's a safety measure. And I, I think that law actually lasted 30 some years before it's repealed. Obviously, you know, it wouldn't make any sense today. You know, a lot had advanced both the laws and, and safety features in cars and, and the operation of motor vehicles. And, you know, you look at cars today, do they strictly adhere to the law as the minimum and that's it? Certainly, it has a lot of safety features, safety features that are required by law, but many cars also have safety features that go beyond, beyond the law. You know, why do they do that? Because maybe because they understand that people desire safety and the law, the minimum required by the law is maybe not, doesn't go far enough. So in order to earn the trust of customers and the need for safety, they provide features that go beyond what's required by law. Uh, and you know, it, I think about Microsoft, it's you know, just us as humans. You know, when we conduct ourselves, we don't just conduct ourselves in the minimum in terms of what's required by law. You know, we, we have ethics, we have morals. And the people at company, I think of colleagues that I work with, they come to work every day, they don't park their values at the door, they bring it with them. And, and so they as humans want, care about doing the right thing, not just the minimum required by law. And also, it's like I said, it's a matter of trust. Nobody's gonna use our technology if they don't trust us. People don't wanna use things they don't trust. So to earn that trust is not enough to do what is required by law. We have to figure out what it is that we're doing in what scenario, in what context, what's reasonable, what's responsible, and try to meet that expectation. You know, otherwise, we don't earn that trust and we don't keep that trust. Um, I, about data, I wanna make a comment about data and discrimination. That's, that's a important topic to talk about because it's really central. As I said, modern AI often involves machine learning, and, and like any science, any technology is not perfect, but it does make important contributions. And um, as to whether AI is here, 
I think that's a reasonable debate. From, from where I'm sitting, from what we're seeing, AI is already here being used in many fields. Machine learning is used being, being used in many fields. It's absolutely correct that there is the risk of discrimination. And with machine learning, what it is, it's critical, the data that we use, there was a study uh, where they found that after crunching the data, they found that people with asthma is actually uh, less likely to die of pneumonia. Very counterintuitive. And the reason they found out was that ultimately after consulting with medical experts, they found that the reason is because if you are an asthma sufferer, you're probably gonna get much more immediate medical intervention being checked into hospital when you're sick. So the chances you actually die from pneumonia is much lower. So they figured that out and understand why the data make that prediction. Then the question then is, well, should, should they take out that data point about people having uh, asthma uh, so the, to, in terms of deciding the risk of dying from pneumonia? And the data scientist finds out that no, you don't want to do that because when you remove a data point, all the other data fields are already affected by the fact that some peop those people have asthma. They are already kind of polluted. And the, the effect is hidden. And if you remove that data point now, why the data is skewed is opaque to you. It's actually better to include more data so that you can account for that abnormality. So it's really critical that you have good, thorough data because if you omit some data, you have externalities that you're not counting for, blind spots you don't see, and the predictions that the machine learning give you are bad. They're not accurate. They're less accurate from flipping a coin if you omit, omit a lot of important external, externalities. But then, you know, I also hear the concerns about privacy. I mean, that's the conundrum. In order for the machine learning to be high quality and pr produce prediction that's highly accurate, you need a lot of different types of data and a lot of them. You know, if you have a, if a, a, if a bank trying to make loan decisions, they only include data from past applicants, people that they grant loans to, and they are all, you know, uh, Caucasian, male, uh, et cetera, then this, that prediction model is probably going to skew towards only favoring people that are also Caucasians and male, and therefore if you're female and of other races, you probably don't get as good a chance of getting granted a loan. So it's really important to test your data to see whether it is representative so that the machine learning is fair and reasonable and actually account for and address those biases. But then it, it, the conundrum is if you want, want more data, you have to address privacy concerns because people are understandably concerned when you use a lot of data. So we need to address people's concerns about data protection and privacy. And again, not only comply with laws such as GDPR, but also think about what is truly responsible practices so that people can trust that as we use that data, it's being used in a responsible way for their benefit without violating data protection laws or invading their privacy. Yeah, just to quickly pick up on some of the things that was said, I think the, the example of the flag in front of the car, I think, is that the Lotum, Locomotive Act? Um, that Bernard talked about. I think it's fundamentally different in the case of machine learning because in the case of a car, you can see the car and if a car hits you, you will definitely feel it. And if you've been hit by a car, you know where to go to say, I am hurt here or I'm bleeding or hopefully you're still alive. The problem with artificial intelligence is that it is more often than not intangible. You don't know you're being subject to a system that has reduced you to a data point and you don't know who to appeal to. Um, even if it's in the case of a state-deployed artificial intelligence system, even if, you apply, uh, even if you appeal to the state, it's often said, well, the, the system said this, we didn't say it, and we don't know why the system said it, so you can come and appeal to us every time you're wrongfully denied a service, but we can't actually tell you why you were hit by that metaphorical car. So I think it's fundamentally different in the case of systems that you cannot peer into, that you cannot see, and that you cannot control, and that are subjectively and selectively made and built by certain stakeholders only. Um, the second thing about machine learning um, is that I think it's a great tool if you want the future to look like the past. It's a fantastic tool if you want to replicate the past into the future and be efficient and quick while doing so. It's not an efficient tool when societal complexities are in the fray because I think 
regardless of where you stand politically or socially or whatever discipline you know you come from i think it's safe to say that we don't necessarily want to repeat social discrimination mistakes from the past and the problem with machine learning is that it obscures these very complicated systemic human problems into a simple data point that then become a reflection of what we want a good decision to look like in the future so i think while in the case of health uh, you know there are enormous benefits to be had i think there's also a huge danger because there's enough research to show that there are only certain types of people who have been able to access healthcare in the past um, that overlap with certain types of genetic problems or not that overlap with how male versus female um, patients are treated and and all of these institutional realities and human pitfalls that data can never um, i think fully capture and i think being mindful of that regardless of how representative your data is it's still a reflection of one human interaction that is almost always harmful to those who have been disadvantaged already um, yeah and I, i also would like to uh, pick up two points one is uh, the point of trust that uh, ethics are a way to build trust but if you look at a lot of the technology that we use and we actually think of the companies behind them you can question for yourself if you actually trust them and the answer might be a bit in the middle that you might have a little bit of an uneasy feeling about it because we all use these big services and we all know that they're not that respectful for our privacy for instance so trust is not a one dimensional thing usually trust is a multi dimensional thing take uh, google for example your gmail they're very secure they also uh, look at your data so it's not like a, a a one way or one thing fits all it's a very complex process of do you actually trust these companies behind it so i don't think and then the question is also what you can do as a user or like as an individual who then gets subjected to these systems so i think trust is maybe not the right wording um and then also when we talk about accuracy this is very common like in the fatamel discussion about how like how accurate can we make these systems can we make them less biased can we make them less discriminatory for instance uh and also if you look at some of the principles behind these ethical guidelines they're about privacy they're about sort of um uh things like this like accuracy but also if you look at uh the european guidelines on trustworthy ai the first thing is actually that it should be lawful and then you can question what is lawful because it's always happening in a context even if you have the fairest system in the world or the most accurate system in the world it might actually not be applied very fair so if you take a look at for instance um facial recognition or uh, fraud detection in welfare systems they always targets they in their piloting phase they usually target specific parts of cities specific cities and not the general population so there was just a um a lawsuit in the Netherlands uh, against Siri which is a fraud detection uh, algorithm for uh, welfare fraud and it was only tested in six areas and these were very low income areas because the government has the most data about them so also like even if this is an accurate system even if they actually uh, predicted it, it's only applied to one proportion of the population and not to the others so is that then fair so we have to look at the situation in which they're being applied to and then also about like um the there's somebody in the room here who was involved with the creation of the uh, EU uh, guidelines on trustworthy AI and i think uh, from the civil society perspective also a lot of criticism has been um who have been part of this process have have been raised about sort of the process about how these guidelines were created who was in the room uh, how it's being applied currently because now we have these very beautiful guidelines but it's still questionable if they will actually also be implemented in the EU horizon 2020 AI funding so then if we have them are they actually being applied across the board by the EU so there's so many questions also around these ethical guidelines and i think there's a lot of knowledge in the room as well i'm curious to hear about all of this but i think just looking at the technology itself is too limited um so that puts me to sort of the last question that i would like to ask of the panel before we open it up uh to the rest of the room which is clearly there are a lot of outstanding um questions that need to be asked in context and how to make sure that um that is taken into account in any kind of discussion is one of them and i want to try and sort of ask all of you what are some examples of frameworks of regulation of organizations of actors that you feel are getting it right so can you speak a little bit to debates that you see that you feel are going in the right direction and why that is the case and and what we can learn from that here today tablik
Um, so I've been in a room a few times with Fiduci. I think uh, she's raising very important points. So I think Article 19 is raising some very critical issues. I think Access Now has been involved with a lot of ethical uh, debates. I think they're also pushing for human rights standards and they're doing critical work. Um, it's, I think it will be interesting to see how the San Francisco or the uh, California facial recognition ban is going. Uh, so what are the implications of sort of these types of legislations? Uh, so I think it's like there's a few actors that are very interesting to follow uh, and then see how they will play out. Yeah, I think uh, I agree about the California ban on facial recognition. I think that was the first instance where we saw the existence and the inevitability of machine learning truly being questioned by a critical, you know, through a critical discussion. And I think that's where we need to go because treating these systems as inevitable means we necessarily give up some amount of critique. And I think that is very dangerous given how um, sensitive and how profound the implications are. Um, I generally, um, think that if, if we're going to look at these systems and not treat them like this silver bullet to social problems and not treat it like this extremely complicated robot that might kill us and just look at it for a socio-technical system that must adhere to first principles of law, whether that's international human rights law or constitutional law or consumer protection or whatever body of regulation that is actually verifiable and actionable, I think there's a lot of space for that. I, I don't think enough of that is being done, uh, which is a big uh, you know, gap in current discussions. But I think, yeah, I agree that we need to see how these bans and things play out, but I think just questioning inevitability and looking back on what we already have and not treating these systems as magic would be a great step. I think instead of citing any particular conversation, I think it's just important that we are having them. Uh, as I said in my opening comments, we, we desperately need any and all of these conversations so that we can uh, surface all of these concerns, anxieties, and issues and questions. There's no exception. Every new technology that comes upon the scene through the ages, if they are major, they create fundamental challenges, fundamental changes to society, uh, and um, we need to figure them out, and it causes a lot of concerns and questions. It could also cause a lot of harm, because if you rush into it too fast, then you put your blinders on, you know, you don't see the problems, and you cause the problems. So when it comes to sensitive users, users that could cause harm, you know, Microsoft, for its part, certainly uh, advise caution and proceed with caution to have conversations to figure out where the technology is, what the circumstances are, to use imagination to figure out how could it co go wrong, who could it harm, and how can we mitigate that risk and address that risk. Um, certainly, when Fiduci talked about uh, whether people know they're being harmed or not, I think that goes to the point of transparency. Uh, I didn't have a chance to address that in my previous comments, but we one of our one of the AI principles of Microsoft is transparency. If, if the use of a technology is so big, you don't even know about it, and yet it affects you, uh, the companies that develop technology or the organization that implement it should be transparent, transparent about it so that you know uh, at an instinctual level how it's affecting you, you know, whether it's a loan application or a job application or whatever context it may be. You, you have a right to know how the operation of that technology is affecting your rights. Um, but I, I, you know, the most important thing to have constructive conversation. You know, it, you, when you talk about bans, sooner or later this technology is advancing and organizations are using it. And they use it not, you know, I hear the point that somebody may be trying to demonstrate that they are trying to look good to the public, maybe they are those scenarios. But, Equally, there are a lot of scenarios where organizations are using it because they believe it can help them make better decisions that benefit people, and they're experimenting it and using it and finding it, it can indeed, and it does help them. So this is happening. The question is, how fast does it happen? How thoughtful we are about letting it happen? And as I said in my opening comments, you know, must we choose between ethical framework and the law, human rights law. 
Because you really need both. You really need it all. Because anything that you can help you figure it out, you need to look at it, incorporate it. That's a responsible, constructive way to move forward as a society so that you can take advantage of uh, new technology that, after all, is the product of our human ingenuity. Data scientists comes up with it, and responsible ethical people come up with a way to use it to benefit people. And people in government figure out responsible ways to have thoughtful regulations to mitigate uh, the risks of, this, of these users violating people's rights. So everyone has a role, and everyone has a constructive role to make sure that it is being used in a responsible way that benefits society. Thank you. And on that note um, of the call for constructive conversations, I would like to open it to the floor. If there's any questions, I would also like to ask you to briefly introduce yourself and keep your question uh, snappy, as there are many. Um, I'll start from the right-hand side. Thank you. Um, I'm Veronica Thiel. I'm an advisor for Algorithm Watch. We've compiled a global inventory of AI ethics guidelines. At the last count, which hasn't yet been published, we found 106. And as Vidushi said, uh, we're not really that bothered with looking at the, extreme, the exact content of it because they're all broadly the same. What we found absolutely startling is that um, there is next to no um, evidence of any sort of self-regulating enforcement. So what happens if somebody within a company that has a shiny dancing, singing AI guideline is not adhering to it? There is very little information out there. I think we found six, roughly, who have anything like that. So in other words, it seems it's more of a fig leaf. The other thing and the question I would pose to the panel is, um, how long are we going to talk about AI ethics as if this were something completely new? Corporate social responsibility has been around since the 1960s. We're still struggling to get companies to adhere to certain principles of like you know, child labor, environmental um, carefulness, and all that sort of thing. At the moment, the AI, the ethics discussion is discussed as if it is something completely new, whereas the basic principles of do no harm is really not that hard to understand. And Google, after all, started out by saying do no evil. So yes. Um, for me, it's not a discussion whether or not we should have AI ethics. For me, it's a discussion about how we're going to get companies to finally adhere to standards that we all seem to be agreeing on that is a good idea. Thank you. Um, I think, like, I agree it's completely nothing new. Uh, what I do think is that uh, we should also celebrate the things that people are actually doing that are uh, not related to uh, ethics. So, uh, for instance, um, even though they didn't completely win, I think it's very important that Liberty, for instance, took the South Wales Police to court for applying facial recognition in it. And this is actually then trying to, because there's no, at the moment, no real legal framework to govern the use of facial recognition within the UK. And so they're trying to push for the creation of new legal standards, not ethical standards, legal standards. And I think, I think this should be one celebrated. We should also acknowledge the fact that this is a very long process that Liberty is uh, going on. I also think that in this we should question where the money is coming for, from, from the South Wales Police to do it, because in any, any other sector uh, that has been hit by austerity, if then from the central government you get a tech budget, of course you're going to use it and apply it, and this is what we're seeing in the UK police landscape, is where they've been hit with massive austerity, and then the Home Office has said, here we have a, a police transformation fund that you can use for tech innovation. Uh, so uh, even well, everybody in the NGO scene also knows that as soon as there's money for AI, AI and ethics, we're also working on AI and ethics. It's just because like, this is the way the world works. And so while I think it's very important what Liberty is doing, I also think we should question the Police Transformation Fund at the same time, because they are creating the enabling environment for uh, police to implement these type of technologies. So I do think there's a lot of things, other things happening. Yeah, I, I just, just I can't speak for other companies because I'm not familiar with the internal process. You know, we Microsoft has AI principles, and we have process and procedures to rever to review business scenarios to make a decision whether we should proceed or not. And there have been, uh, you know, I can't talk about private confidential instances, but there we have made public acknowledgement of a police request scenario where we turned down the request. You know, we we take that very seriously because. 
principles are not principles if uh, the revenue involved, you know, we go after revenue and sacrifice the principles, then it's not principles anymore. So we, we do hold ourselves accountable to review, have procedures in place, review business opportunities to see is this something that we feel live up to our principles and whether we should proceed or not. And, you know, we should help hold ourselves accountable and uh, society should hold each other accountable in terms of uh, government regulations as well as private sector companies that develop the technology and the companies that use it. Hi, I'm Guru from IT for Change. Uh, I think all the panelists agreed on the principle that legal framework is essential. I think everybody agreed on that. Even the example of the car safety, the ethical possibilities are beyond the legal requirements and they do not substitute the legal requirements. So I think that's a point. And I didn't know there are 70 ethical frameworks, but recently uh, the JustNet coalition of which IT for Change is the part came out with principles for legal framework creation. And I just read out five of those principles, which are very relevant for deriving legal frameworks that will work for everybody. Principle one, data subjects must own their own data individually and collectively. So the whole issue of ownership of data is very important, even though the private sector collects it, does it own it? And who is able to derive value from it and who is able to exploit the data is an important consideration. Two, our data requires protection from abuse. Three, we need the tools to control our data. Four, data commons uh, need appropriate governance frameworks. And finally, data protection, sharing, and use require new institutions. So I think legal framework, institutional frameworks are absolutely essential if we need uh, AI to work for us in an ethical manner. And ethical frameworks are a part of the whole thing, but we need to go far beyond that. I have the principles with me. If anybody's interested, they can pick it up from me afterwards. Um, Anupam Guha from Center for Policy Studies, IIT Bombay. I am essentially an AI policy researcher. Uh, first, I would like to thank the panel for at least acknowledging that regulation is at the key of this debate, and that's, that's new. But one word I was trying to, like, I was hoping to hear one word, because it has been a very critical panel, and that word has not yet been heard. It's capital. So rights. Uh, include the right to life and the right to equality. And uh, machine learning systems are ultimately systems which uh, amplify and make efficient current modes of social relationships. So when are we going to start talking about material power, about intelligence, influence, control, and most importantly, wealth? And who are these systems helping? So an, uh, an analogy was made of cars. Well, uh, many people who are into economic history like me know that the prevalence of cars, for example, in the United States of America, was not due to them organically being better than, say, trains. These were very contested political things. Lobbying was involved, Chase Henry was involved, and ultimately you have a reality where uh, people who have the wealth to buy cars are privileged over people who would probably require public transport. Um, I'm not saying that's what the AI situation is, but it could become like that. We are seeing a lot of function creep in the country where I come from, India. You see uh, often code precedes policy. You have uh, artifacts being made, being peddled to state, being peddled to private actors, things like facial recognition, which was mentioned, and then those things become the de facto standard, and then policy catches up later and tries to play eight dimensional chess to justify the world that already exists. So when are we going to start talking about influence and material wealth? Because I think that's central to the question of any rights-based framework. Thank you. Yeah, I, I fully agree, Anupam. Thank you for that. I think when we think about artificial intelligence systems, there's always a focus on the stage of deployment when it already exists, when someone's denied a loan or someone is wrongly identified. Um, and I think if we're going to reserve our critique to that system and to that stage, we're always going to be too late. And thinking about the origin, the conceptualizing, the design, and then the development and testing and then deployment, I think you're absolutely right. If we follow the money and follow the incentives, it's a much more effective way. Okay. 
Uh, okay, uh, Thiago Moraes, I'm uh, wearing two hats here. One is a researcher from Brazil, which is particularly uh, interested in the topic of facial recognition because this has been implemented in my country for a while, since 2011. But also as a representative of the European Data Protection Supervisor, which I am currently working. So my question is to Microsoft. First of all, uh, I feel very relieved to know that a giant tech like Microsoft has decided to consider ethical principles before accepting business opportunities with government institutions. Particularly, I was pleased to see some public statements from the company, such as the commitment to honor California's privacy law, the CCPA. My question today is, what I would like to know what's Microsoft's approach in other commercial relationships, most particularly B2B and B2C relationships, and, for example, I give facial recognition. If it's being provided by Microsoft, I don't know, but if it's being provided by Microsoft in any B2B or B2C relationship, what are the conditions, the contractual uh, relate, uh, clauses or whatever that's being uh, uh, proposed by Microsoft to ensure that its service will provide minimal safeguards to protect the privacy of its customers? Thank you. Yeah. Um, with regard to facial recognition, including the, in, in addition to general AI principles, we have also principles on the use of AI that includes fairness, accountability, transparency, uh, and specifically also law enforcement surveillance use. So those are the principles we go by. You know, is the is the facial recognition fair? So, for example, if the data is uh, biased and representative, such as suggested earlier and have a high error rate for people uh, of color or, uh, or for different gender, then it, it is not fair and it would not be appropriate to use that technology. Uh, and also transparency. For example, if you are using uh, the technology to scan everybody in public, should there be some notice uh, so that people uh, know, know that technology is being used? So those are the questions that I think not just Microsoft internally need to consider, the public should have the conversation because it affects everybody and, and it informs all of us if we have those conversations to uh, arrive at a norm, you know, what is it that we in society expect? Because on the one hand, law enforcement that are acting in good faith, they are trying to protect all of us, public safety. And public safety is a human right too. You know, we all want to be safe and protected from harm. You know, that, you know we. You know, in these conversations, we should not forget about that. But at the same time, we don't want to sacrifice civil liberties and other rights and, uh, as we pursue the protection of public safety. So we need to have those conversations, not only within companies alone, but as a society, as to what is it reasonable for the, for the police to do? Because in the absence of that, then a government is left on its own and to figure out, you know, when is it that they can engage and use this technology uh, to pursue law enforcement and protection of public safety. But if those conversations are had, and we go through all those scenarios, not just the ones I mentioned, then you know, either that becomes law, you know, at some point maybe it's not a ban, maybe it's some permitted use to say that police, yes, you can use it in these cases, but in these cases is not allowed. Even, though the, even if the technology could put conceivably used because society believes that it is not the right balance between public safety and people's civil liberties, we would not allow it to proceed. Hi, my name is Idonje. I'm a data scientist working in Sri Lanka and across South Asia. Firstly, I would like to thank Lavika, I hope I didn't massacre your name, for um, pointing out that perhaps people have watched a little too much Terminator 2 and uh, that there are different modes of explainability and different granularities to this. Um, going by the discussion of uh, some others as well. There seem to be a few problems uh, clashing at the table. And the first is the demand for explainability, the need to understand the black boxes that we live under. Um, the second conflicting with that is anti-competitive law, where some countries let their corporations say that this is our secret source and that we can't reveal it. Then the third is, of course, the issue of bias, which exists in every system, 
machine or human, and it is mathematically impossible to engineer a system that does not have some error rate in making addition between any two gri given groups, unless it is a condition of perfect prediction, which we don't, we don't live in that world. So what I'd like to ask, because you have been studying the laws and the conversation on this, is why is nobody talking about accreditation of systems? Because if you take a machine learning system apart, uh, we should be able to examine the data sets, critically interrogate the biases therein, study the shape and distribution of the data and the categories therein, and discuss whether these data categories belong to uh, revealing information on protected classes of people or not. Um, and even if we do not uh, expose, expose the black box itself, in a machine, given a machine learning system, we should be able to feed it enough input, perhaps synthetic data, in instances where feeding it actual data is unethical, examine the outputs, feed it enough different distributions of input data so that we can judge its responses under different conditions and make a judgment. And potentially to look at what a human error rate is, is what we consider acceptable in a particular domain and then test this system critically against a human, against that given, against that uh, sort of accepted error rate and then make a judgment on whether to use this system or not. Um, is there a conversation on doing this? Because this is practically possible with the level of technology and with the legal structures we have today. Explainability is still theoretically on a very mathematical level, it's still a pipe dream. Um, is there a conversation on this? And that is the first I'd like to ask. Um, I would like to ask that tough, pretty much anyone who would like to take it. Um, the second is a sort of general comment uh, addressed to Bernard from Microsoft. Um, the libertarian ideal that companies should be able to regulate themselves and have done so is perhaps a little naive. I understand that Microsoft has many good faith attempts and that you do not leave your morals at the door when you walk into work, but you're not the only people doing this stuff. As a case in point, right now there is a, a particular company that has brought something to the parliament in my country saying we have solved hate speech. Uh, it's, it's this Norwegian company that's doing AI. So we ask, well, what's it doing? They haven't the slightest clue, but it's a Norwegian company, and therefore it is AI. Right, this is the level of conversation in many instances, and where you potentially stop and say, no, this is unethical. And the Californian thing is hilarious to me because it was California that banned facial recognition, it was Californian law enforcement that requested facial recognition of Microsoft where you potentially say this is unethical and stop, another actor sees a business case and says maybe I can put a system there. I think that also needs to be addressed, particularly in the global south, where a lot of these systems come into play without ever being discussed in fora like this. I, I absolutely agree with you. I, if, in case my early comments were unclear, I, Microsoft absolutely believe that regulation has a place, and you cite an example that, you know, if some companies act responsibly, you could have the scenario where others don't. So regulations absolutely have a role to play in making sure that there's responsible use of AI. Um, I want to quickly check off some of the other questions you raised. In terms of black box, I would just say that we need to remember that uh, while we sh absolutely should be concerned about transparency, of machine learning or new technology, we need to consider that before we have that, when let's say in the good old days of pure human decision making, um, that is not necessarily that transparent either. Uh, you know, yeah, loan ab applications. Absolutely, right? which is why the right. subject is being broached in certain circles on the technical front, because a doctor testifying in a court of law mm -hmm. is not his testimony may not necessarily even be understood by the judge, but we look at their accreditation, we look at their history of work to understand whether this man is evil or not, and perhaps can that process be applied? Right. Yeah, when you have a human decision maker making a decision, that decision could be biased and discriminatory. It could all be, also be unconscious. The decision maker may not even know that he or she is being biased. So the point I want to make is that Machine learning actually could, if used wisely and constructively, it could actually help address that problem because of the presence of data. You mentioned error rate, and 
companies that develop and organizations that implement this technology have that both the opportunity and the responsibility to try to address error rate, to address that opaqueness of a pure human decision maker that we used to live with, and, and, and do testing. Because machine learning is not just the development of a decision a prediction model. You test it. You test it by, for example, the following. If you're trying to make loan decisions, you look at, you certainly don't want to repeat and perpetuate mistakes of the past. But with machine learning, one approach that data scientists share with me you can do is you first build a model based on historical data. And then you uh, wisely create a test data set of a, a wide spectrum of loan, uh, uh, loan applicants with varying degree of background, income level, ethnic groups, gender, et cetera. And then you stress test that model that's based on the past and see how it did. And when it came out that it just most of the time deny loans to minorities, to female, et cetera, et cetera, you have very strong empirical evidence that the historical model of the past has a problem and it needs to be addressed. So, I mean, there, m machine learning and AI can be a force of good if you use it responsibly and creatively. Uh, and then your point about, I'll close by addressing a point about accreditation. In connection with facial recognition, Microsoft has proposed that in order to address this very sensitive use, that companies, tech companies that provide this technology make available public API, application program interface, so that anyone, any researchers can access the system that's developed and stress test it with data to see how it does, so that it verifies where it is accurate and where it is fair and unbiased. So I think that's absolutely critical. We need to find ways to uh, allow people to gain that trust, whether that technology is being de developed in a way that address error rate and bias issues. Um, I think the argument that we can make machines less biased than humans because we can see where the bias comes from, um, I think it's an interesting academic exercise, but I still stand by what I said earlier in that you cannot teach a machine um, how to feel and you cannot teach the machine what discrimination looks like and what past discrimination um, is because of in systemic inequality. So I differ a little bit and I think we may be oversimplifying it by saying we can point where the discrimination comes from. Um, to your question about where, um, you know, to, to your question about like understanding black boxes, I think Cynthia Rudin has done fantastic work to show that using a black box algorithm is not necessarily better than using a more scrutable algorithm. Um, I think the accreditation system, I don't know if I've seen something specifically like that, but impact assessments are becoming increasingly popular. Um, I think, however, the problem is that it ends up becoming a game of whack-a-mole. So you assume that, okay, this could be bias on the basis of gender, and then you fix that, but given the, the huge amounts of data sets, you never know how a system will function and what it takes up as a, um, you know, a discriminating factor. Well, actually, you could because there's significant I, work. I want to be a little bit mindful of the number of questions in the room and not make this too much of a background yeah, for sorry. me. ask you to take it up over coffee. Sorry, I just want to counter with that saying no, no, you no. could. Of course, I just also want to make sure everyone gets heard. I'll stop there so other people are heard. Maybe can I say, add one more thing? I think uh, this is, a, when you sit in the sort of the FET and MELD or the fairness, accountability and machine learning community, there's a lot of, there's, this is often the rebuttal where there's like humans make mistakes too. So who makes less mistakes? Is it machines or humans? Uh, and then how can we make machines make less humans? But it's a false dichotomy because these machines and humans interact together. So it's not like usually the mistakes get added on top of each other. Um, and then uh, maybe a call out to the room if like anybody knows any implementation of AI that are actually for good come find me afterwards because I haven't found one yet. Uh, so because there's always a lot of issues around it. So I think while we're all very critical about the use of AI, especially more in the sort of academic and NGO circles, I do think that it would be interesting to figure out the cases where it's actually used for good. Maybe it's like spam detection or maybe it's like more infrastructure related because I would like to see these examples and then explore them to actually think like what, are the, what is then so good about it. So that was my comment about like a force for good. If you have examples, come talk to me. Um, in which case, I know that a lot of people are having to go to other panels, so we can entertain one more question before we have to slowly uh, head off. 
And so, hello, my name is Mariana Gomez. I come from Brazil. I am a, a student of journalism over there. And as a youth IGF, I would like to ask you guys um, that we are as different mood stakeholders, which world we want to build, really? Because right now in my country, I see a lot of, um, a lot of initiatives using AI, especially um, to discriminate and to reinforce racism over there. We are facing a huge problem with our security, uh, public security policies. And I would like to suggest for all stakeholders uh, at this panel, and uh, that maybe we should um, look for different strategies. And one I, I, I'd like to suggest to, for you guys is the one called intersectionality, um, built um, through these experiences of black women in African diaspora. But it's something that has already been used um, in law in the law field, but it needs to be spread because when we think about intersectionality, we don't think about uh, especially um, what, I, what, what is the profile of a person who is being discriminated, but we look, uh, we tend to look to the structure and look into the structure, we can, um, we can address uh, humanity and I think that uh, there is something that needs to be reinforced in humanity, and intersectionality can help us to see the blind spots um, where we are thinking on companies and civil society demands. Because as a young black woman in Brazil, I'm really afraid of the use of AI um, for some new kind of colonialism, and that's it. Yeah, I think you're spot on. And you've said very eloquently what it took many people years and years to say, which is that an intersectional approach is absolutely necessary. And it's hard to do, but I don't think that should stop the, the conversation from going there. And I think uh, fairness, accountability, transparency, and machine learning in the last three years, I think, has come a long way from looking at solutionism and coming up with technical definitions of various um, you know, fairness or transparency and looking at how it interacts with different intersections of society. So thank you for that. You, you, what, what you said really strike a chord with me because uh, Microsoft believes that this technology should be for everyone. Inside the company, we use this buzzword of de democratizing AI. But what it really boils down to what it means is that this technology, technology shouldn't be confined to the rich and powerful, the biggest institutions. If we can make the technology available so that any organizations with an idea on how to improve people's lives, how to have responsible use to data to build a prediction model, not to have the machine blindly apply the decisions, again, just to a uh, sidebar, you know, you, Microsoft, one, of Microsoft, one of the things that Microsoft emphasizes is that humans need to be in the loop. It's not a false choice between either or. You only rely on the technology or you rely on humans. You really need both. Machine doesn't know what's ethical, but humans do. That's why when you test the model, you stress test with good test data, you look at the results, and people of good faith see the results that minorities, female, are being denied loans, it would recognize the bias and would push and call for changes so that the institution that's actually making those decisions would make changes so that they can become more fair. And we want all institutions around the world to be able to have access to this technology so that they can apply good faith, responsible, and beneficial use. Uh, and that could address, partly go to address the concern you, you have. In terms of, you know, I, there are so many examples of good uses. There's one example that I recall. I want to cite it because it's not even used by a huge institution. There's an organization called PATH, P-A-T-H. Uh, I don't really know a ton about it. I just remember reading it some time ago. One of their projects to, to, is to help uh, address the problem of malaria in, in Africa. And they did a project in, in a country in 
African, I apologize, was too long ago, I don't remember all the details, where they use machine learning and, and analyzing data to find out ways to use medical supplies and treatment and patterns of diseases to predict where they need to direct their efforts to be most effective. And I believe, I could be wrong about the precise data because I don't have perfect memory, but I think the scale was before they started, the infection rate in this region or in this country or this part of this country was like 50%, like one in two people gets malaria. But after using machine learning and be more uh, effective in applying their efforts in medicine and treatment, I believe the infection rate went down to one or two percent. One or two, one or two people in 100 as opposed to one in two. I would say that for those 48 people, it makes a difference. I think they like the fact that they've been helped. So I would suggest that this is technology that is beneficial. Absolutely, there could be problems, but we, and we absolutely need to use laws, ethics, guidelines, policies, whatever we can come up with to help us so that we use it responsibly because it can bring benefit when we do that. Um, on that note and that important call to take an intersectional uh, lens from the, the youth coalition here at the IGF, I hope you will all join me in thanking our speakers and I hope that this will result in many interesting conversations over lunch. <laughs>